In 2006, Uganda's commercial oil resources were confirmed, and this historic event has been a source of pride and anticipation for Ugandans. Early this year, the final investment decision was signed, and it led to the questions, what are the opportunities that Ugandans can access in the oil and gas sector? In studio, I have Richard Nuagaba, Drilling and Completions Manager of Uganda National Oil Company, to discuss the mandate of the company and the opportunities you can access. And remember, to be part of the conversation, you have to go to our social media platforms, that is Twitter and Facebook. Use the hashtag OilUganda. Mr. Nuagawa, good morning. Uh, I think actually it's, it's afternoon already. It's afternoon already. <laughs> Wonderful. So good afternoon, viewers. Good afternoon. Yeah. Ha, uh, please tell us, what does a drilling and completions manager do exactly? Uh, well, um, we before I do that, I think I'll first go through the mandate of you know, then maybe you'll understand mm. better what a drilling and completions manager does. Yes, so the mandate of you know, is to invest on behalf of government or take care of the ma commercial mandate uh, of government in oil and gas industry. Mm. And when you talk of the oil and gas industry, we are s spanning from the upstream up to the downstream. So on the upstream, we have state participation. That is in the two projects, uh, Kingfisher and Tilenga, where for which the FID was uh, undertaken uh, on uh, 1st February 2022. Mm. So we have 15% uh, stake in those two projects. Of course, we have another other new ventures we are looking at. So we are looking at acquiring new exploration licenses um, and maybe in future we, we might invest in oil field services as a new business line. Mm. Then now on the midstream, we have about uh, three main projects in there. Uh, one of them is the ECOP, where we also still have um, a 15 percent shareholding uh, in the mid in the midstream. Um, we have the Kaba Industrial Park. That's where Pump Station One is going to uh, sits, and even the airport. The Kabale Airport sits mm. in the Kabale Industrial Park. So okay. that one is also managed by Enoch. Uh, we have the, the Kampala Storage Terminal. As you approach Vulova, that's where it sits. Uh, that one is still under you know, initial stages of development. Um, and of course, at a future date, um, we expect to have a, a, a 60,000 barrels per day refinery. It's not on stream now. But the field studies are done, and we expect it to come at a future date. The FID for the, the final project will come at a future date. Mm. Now, in the downstream, we have two main businesses. There's the ginger storage, tam uh, uh, storage terminal. It stores uh, both uh, the, the diesel and, and, um, and petrol. That's where the strategic reserves of the country sit. So we manage that as well. And we also have a bulk trading um, of uh, both uh, Argo and uh, PMS, that is petroleum and diesel also, we do bulk trading in, in, in that segment. So on brief, or in brief, that's the mandate of UNOC. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to your point of what a drilling and completion manager does, like I've said, where we are active right now is in under state participation, where we, we are joint operators, or joint, I mean joint venture partners. Yeah with uh, Total and Sinok. I've told you 15% shareholding. Mm. And uh, what happens therein is that we're non-operators. The operator for Tilenga project is Total. The operator for the Kingisha project is Sinok. But we have to make sure that we, you know, we maximize the shareholder value, which is 15%, to our shareholders uh, who is the Minister of Finance and mm. the Minister of, of, uh, of Minerals and Development. Yeah. So we do our own independent you know, studies, you know, look at um, the operator's work programs and budgets, make sure that whatever is being proposed is value for money at the planning phase and also you know, follow up the implementation phase, you know, the studies that are being or the operations that are going to make sure that, you know, it's value for money being implemented. Yeah. Yeah. So in Indeed. brief, that's what we do. 
early this year, the final investment decision was signed off. And there was excitement among us Ugandans looking at the possible opportunities that we could gain as a country. What are some of those? Um, well, before you talk of the, of the final investment decision, um, I think you need to uh, you know, look back at how it all began. Yeah. You know, in 2006, we have the first discovery. Then, you know, more licenses are uh, issued, you know, mm. more exploration wells are drilled. They are this appraisal, you know, it's a process basically, you know, you find first, appraise the extent, mm. where, you know, if it's a discovery, then, you know, how far does the discovery go? Then there's, you know, in the PSA, there is, you know, a, a mechanism uh, which you must follow. Uh, you know, explore, appraise, then apply for a production license. Yeah. Then thereafter, you make an investment decision to invest in the project. So, we had production licenses being issued uh, for Kingfisher 2012 uh, for the Tilenga wells. We have the, the uh, you know the production license being issued in 2016. Now, from 2012, now 2022, the final investment decision is made, and. Our joint venture partners, because you know, as um, in the, the two projects where we, we call state participation, we are carried up to first oil. So we spend, the companies spend, but we, you know, you know, does not contribute until first oil. So we are carried up to that uh, period. Mm -hmm. So the companies now, which is Total and, and Sinok, Total Energies, it's called now. Uh, made a decision that we are going to invest us also as joint ventures we agree uh, to that decision that monies are going to be spent that means that some scope of work has been approved and frozen because there will be changes mm. some cost baseline has also been approved you know to fulfill the, that work program as perceived by that time now if we you have to talk about what did um, the FID cover. Like I already said, that FID covered two projects on the upstream side, where we have the Kingfisher project, uh, supposed to produce 40,000 barrels per day of crude. Uh, it is on the Hooker Flats, uh, uh, it's almost the extreme end of the, of, of the deepest uh, part of the uh, rift of the Albert and Grabin. Yeah. Um, then we have uh, the Tlenga project a bit north of it, of the Kingfisher, still in the Abbott and uh, uh, Graben. We expect 100,000, uh, 100, 90,000 barrels of crude uh, per day at peak. And of course, that FID also involved um, the, the pipeline, mm -hmm. the ECOP, which is supposed to take the crude from, you know, what we call pump station number one, because everything before pump station number one is, you know, perceived or described as part of the upstream. Yeah. So it's what we call the delivery point is at Kabale. Uh, well, yet I talked about the Kabale Industrial Park, that's yes. where the pump station number one starts. Then we have almost a heated pipeline, the longest in the world, by the way, starting from Kabale, going up to Tanga in Tanzania, then the crude is exported to the international markets there after. If I'm um, to go deeper into the, the other projects for the Kingfisher, um, we are talking about, uh, we have four well pads, but we start with three. Um, we have um, about 31 wells. We have a CPF in there. Uh, we have uh, a feeder pipeline. Now, when crude comes from the well pads, so on the well pads, it's a, look at it as a football pitch, we have several wells. We have oil producers, and for us to produce this crude, we need to inject water to maintain the pressure high mm. so that it comes to the surface at the rates, at the production rates that we desire. So we also have water injectors on the same well pads to reduce the footprint. That's why we do not spread it all over the whole field. So we have four well pads to produce 
40,000 barrels of oil per day. So we have producer wells that are that same oil pad and injector wells are, the, are those oil pads. Um, then we also have the, you know, the inter interconnection lines. So when we produce the crude from the oil heads, it moves the central processing facility. It's what we call the CPF, mm. where it comes, it's, com it's combined. So we have uh, crude combined with water and gas. So it goes through the CPF, is what it's called a central processing facility. So the processing part of it, what we are doing is trying to separate the oil from water and gas. Mm. Now, for the gas, the intended use of the gas is basically we are going to go ahead and use it for generating power to run the facilities in the field. And part of it will be used to generate LPG you know LPG for cooking you know in, in both the industrial and domestic in homes and we we'll have some industrial users mm. now the water of course goes back and is treated and re-injected just for environmental purposes and also to minimize the water being picked from the lake for injection purposes so we also have a feeder line a pipeline it's 10 inch in size moving from Kingfisher up to the pumping station number one in Kavali where it's combined with the crude coming from Tilenga, then it is pumped to uh, the export terminal in Tanga. Mm. So now for Tilenga, we have 31 well pads, whereas for Kingfisher we had four because the production in Tilenga is higher. So for Tilenga, we're talking about 100,090 100, barrels per day at peak. That's what we call the plateau. Mm. Five years in about that, then it starts falling off the plateau. And we're talking about 426 wells, whereas for Kingfisher, we have only 31 wells. Still, we have an inter interconnection network between the different well pads, the 31 we're talking about. Mm. Connect the fluids, count the CPF, process them, well inject the produced water, gas, goes power, and LPG also for, uh, for Tilenga. What remains as crude, stabilized, you know, right content of water, right content of sand, you export it. Kabale combined with Kingfisher and it goes to the export terminal. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course we have other you know road networks in the field, inter intrafield uh, pipelines. I've also talked about them. Water abstraction for pa for you know for injection also for pressure support in the wells for production is also included. Yeah. So today mainly I will concentrate on um, the upstream bit okay. of the business. Yeah. And that is the two main projects whose FID was made. And I'm talking about the Kingfisher and the Tilenga and the projects. Tilenga. And you asked me a question of what opportunities are available for us. Are available. <laughs> I know that's what everybody I might come to you and ask for a job, Mr. Nwaga. <laughs> <laughs> well, the opportunities uh, come in very f many forms. Yes. Yeah, like you said, they, they are, they are, there will be jobs. Mm -hmm. um, we are talking of over at the peak construction uh, phase, talking about uh, you know 4,500 personnel for one of the projects, you know, in, during the construction phase. So those are direct jobs being given, priority given to the local communities. Mm. Of course, uh, where the expertise doesn't allow, you allow in you know people from other regions, then you also that I'm talking about Uganda, then you spread it, it goes to you know other neighboring countries if that skill set cannot be found here mm. but if it can't be found then you, you have no choice you have to go to the international markets yeah so uh, the oil industry is very highly specialized um, it's new to this country uh, so we really expect some labor to be imported into the country though efforts uh, are being undertaken to minimize that kind of inflow and to make sure that those who come and transfer that skill to the local community, the local people here, mm. so that even after these projects are done, then that capability that remains in the country can be exported. So we can, in the end, we'll be a net exporter of, of, the, of, ski, of skill sets on similar projects. Has the construction started as of now? Yes. Uh, so uh, for the Kingfisher, uh, I don't remember the date, but after the FID, about a month from there, mm. uh, there was, <coughs> excuse me, 
there was a groundbreaking ceremony, and that was on, um, you know, what we call PC1. It's a, a, a construction um, contract mm -hmm. with procurement included, and that one is uh, focuses on the whale pads mainly. Um, w work has started, so it, you prepare the whale pads, and then they will install what we call uh, you know the conductor casings you know they'll be piled up to 30 meters this could protect you know uh, the loose you know, uh, you know close to the ground the, the, the soil is, is loose mm -hmm. so as you really don't want that one to collapse in then a little bit of protection of surface water as yeah. well so a conductor casing is part of that so for the kingfisher it has started um, the construction camp is also, as also work has started in the construction camp. Um, when, you, when you go north of the Nile, uh, not north of the Nile, but uh, the Tilenga side, still south of the Nile, yeah. work has started um, earthworks, what we call um, uh, enabling infrastructure. So enabling infrastructure for north of the Nile has so many packages. We have road networks, we have expansion of the airfield, where tr people will be flying from, you know, landing and table, and then they're taken to the field the, the directly. So we need an airfield that is close to the area of operation. So that you reduce the time of travel on the road, because in the park, mm. we have speed limits. We we're talking about 40 kilometers per hour. So if we have the work stations or the work sites 40, 50 kilometers away, uh, or if you want to now, the, the nearest airport, you will ask me why we're not using the uh, the Kabale Airport, <laughs> it's far. <laughs> We're talking about 100 plus kilometers yeah. away. That is a lost time. So you save on that, we have a nearby for, um, even for, uh, for Kingfisher. So for Tilenga, we have a nearby um, um, airfield yeah. called Vugungu. So it's being expanded to allow big aircrafts, uh, that expanding the runway mainly, and having some you know, rest areas and you know, restrooms and all that. Yeah. So that's also a work scope. Mr. Nwagaba, as you talk about transporting oil eventually, because yes. in a space of five years we expect to start drilling and refining. I, as I understand it, railway and water are the best options for transporting oil. Is there something being done or are you partnering as UNOC? Are you making, pulling some strings to make sure that we have a railway in five years? Well, um, and now talking to that, I think um, facts need to be put right. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, first on the, on the project phasing. Yeah. Uh, the drilling starts not in five years. So mm. we, dr we, s we prepare well sites, then put you know, drill wells, hook them up, you know, put up a CPF. So that means starting. Uh, we, we, the, the plan is the, 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 the what we call the the most likely schedule mm -hmm. the planning is doing starts end of this year 2022 okay. mm -hmm. so that's why they're preparing the well pads right now uh, so when that happens then it's to the five years when you're talking about of five years we're talking of 2025 mm -hmm. you know s beginning we're be we expecting first oil so to it's refine it. To yes to refine it no to mm -hmm. transport the to refinery transport comes it later okay these projects are stopping at what we are looking at right now is producing the crude from the wellheads or from the wells, mm. taking it to the central processing facility, process it, take oil out, to that is take gas out, take water out, even with good crude oil, mm. then export. When the refinery is ready, it is 60,000 barrels, but you see at peak we are, put, we are producing you know, 40 plus uh, 90, uh, 190, which makes it 230. Yeah. So the refinery cannot, you know, consume all the crude. Mm. So what happens to what remains? Now, talking of railway and uh, roads and all that, all that was evaluated in the feasibility studies, and <laughs> it's not cost effective. Okay. If you're going to track from here to Mombasa and then load uh, on two ships to the international market, you know, the cost per barrel, for moving that barrel, it becomes very, very high. Mm. So, so to, 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 you know, to maximize the value, we know we have to reduce the tariff, to make sure the tariff is kept as low as possible. So that's why we thought of you know, constructing the pipeline, the East African crude pipeline, ECOP. Mm. And that's why you know, 
the investment decision, the FID had to be, you know, what you call integrated. You cannot make a decision to, you know, that I'm going to drop the fields if you don't have an exit route for the crude. So that's the reason why we had to make sure that the FID for the upstream and the pipeline is, is, signed, off. is signed off at the same time. Mm. So the road network, uh, the, the, the railway would help in bringing in on the logistical part bring in the inputs, the construction materials, the facilities that are going to be used for the CPF later, for the refinery, ETC. Those ones come in very handy. Mm. But the most, you know, commercial method of, you know, exporting or commercializing the crude at, with, at such volumes was the pipeline, and that's what that decision was made. Okay. Yeah. Comforting. Yeah. So how does the local person tap into this? Because you talked about construction of job opportunities. I know hospitality is one of those. Are there certain qualifications? Because you talked about um, having to import uh, labor because probably oil and the gas sector is new to the country and probably we don't have so many people who have gone to study in that aspect. So what are some of those particular skills that a Ugandan can right now go and acquire to stand a chance? Okay, um, effort is being made. Mm. Okay, if we still want to focus on the skill set that is available and uh, through partnerships, or, and th th there are very many enablers. Uh, forget the partnerships, those ones come in later. Yeah. But the enablers, you, you know, you have the Act, the Petroleum Act, specifying how activities are going to be done. You know, it's just the governing law for, the, for, for the how oil is produced. Um, that's the upstream act. Mm -hmm. Now from there you have regulations and one of the key regulations coming from the act is what we call the national content uh, uh, regulations of 2016. Mm -hmm. And those ones uh, specify how the operations are going to be done and how national content is going to be optimized yeah. on these projects. So and if I'm to talk to specific provisions in the national content that um, talk to how uh, national content or participation or opportunities uh, can be maximized. A local Ugandan, uh, we can start from registration um, 10 1, where we have a ring fence mm. around a certain class of goods and services. And um, for the sake of Ugandans out there or, or the viewers who are watching, uh, I think um, I'm going to read the whole list yes. word <laughs> by word so that people can understand. I'm sure some <laughs> are getting ready to write it down. Yes, <laughs> so uh, the list of the services that uh, are ring first for Ugandans, uh, we have transportation, uh, security, uh, food and beverages, uh, hotel and accommodation and catering, human resource management, office supplies, fuel supply, land surveying, clearing and forwarding, crane hire and some other lifting equipment, okay. you know, supply of local available, uh, available materials. We are talking of aggregate, you know, um, maram for, 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 you know, for working on the construction sites, mm -hmm. roads, the ETC, uh, we have talking about the civil works. So now, when we asked me about if work has started, what has started for the Kingfish, I told you mainly is PC1, mm. which is in the construction work on the well pads. We have well pad two and, and three. Work has already started, and we're having materials coming in. So that's where, you know, uh, civil works and supply of materials now fits well there. Um, we have supply of local available drink and production materials. That one might could be limited at the start, yeah. but where, you know, the local Ugandan cannot uh, supply these um, materials or equipment, then that's where the JVs come in. Yeah. If you can't do it, combine with your fellow Ugandans. If, they, if with you, and with your fellow Ugandans, if you cannot satisfy the demand, or, you know, the qualities or and, and the quantities that are being looked for, or the standards that are being specified, step out, go to the region, go to South Africa, go to the rest of Africa, go to the rest of the world, form JVs, make sure you, you, you know, you take on these uh, 
opportunities that are available right now. Then um, also the studies, uh, we want to talk about environmental studies, the EIS, you've heard of them, ASHAs and all that. All those ones are also ring first for local companies, locally registered companies. Mm. Um, communication of information and technology, waste management where possible. So waste management, when we are drilling, yeah. you expect some cuttings to come from the ground combined with mud, so those ones need to be handled. Then there's also general waste uh, being produced on uh, where we have accommodation. We have people, they are eating, they are drinking, they, they are using, you know, washings being undertaken in the camps. Uh, so all that waste that is generated is also handled by another uh, contractor and taken to uh, an approved uh, waste handling site, uh, which yeah. is treated. Uh, of course, you, you, you go through the normal cycle. You want to reduce, you want to reuse and recycle where you nothing can be done. So that is the strategy that you use. So waste handling and management uh, also is ring fenced. So that is on the ring fencing side, basically. So that is one of the enablers where you say that certain services, mm. as I've listed up above there, are going to be undertaken by Ugandan farms. Mm. So it's up to the Ugandan farms to make sure that they optimize. Like I said, the standard being us in the oil and gas industry because, you know, it is a high risk and a, a high investment when the amount being invested in these projects is very high. Mm. So you don't want to take chances. That's why a high level of standards is are set, required. are required, mm. both from the materials being used, the food being served, because labor, like you said, if it's imported, even local, is very expensive. Mm. Then you don't want also people to be falling, or, or, you know, falling ill just because maybe the food that was supplied is not the required standard. That means you're eating into the, wa you know, the time, the schedule Timelines, of the project. falling yes. behind. Yes, you're falling behind. Yeah. So now talking of services available or um, the ring fencing, there are also other enablers uh, where Ugandans can, um, you know, leverage and, uh, you know, get, make sure they maximize their participation in these projects. Yeah. Now we talked about ring fencing. That is done. I explained the services that are under ring fencing. But in addition, uh, Regulation 10.3 talks about unbundling. So there was packages. So if we're talking about enabling infrastructure, say for, for Tilenga, then you have work packages. You have preparation of the site mm. being done by Motor Engine right now. But Motor Engine is subcontracting some scope to local companies then you, you have construction of roads. The roads are also split because from the CPF, you know, to the other well parts, you know, connections. Before, you, ca you can't drive there if there's no road. You, mo you must move materials mm. from where they're being stored in the yards to where the work is being done. So you need road networks. So that scope is also given uh, to another company so that, you know, the Ugandans share on opportunities that are available because as we talk, you know, Still, the costs involved are very high. If you're talking about equipment and the, you know, the coit or the work that is being required, the sums involved are very high. So a single company cannot take on all these activities. So to maximize the participation again, uh, the regulations uh, you know, provide for you know, unbundling of their contracts. If it's this big, try to split into smaller components so that the enough companies or so, you know, more companies can participate. So in addition to and bundling, we also have some labor clauses which also specify that for contracts exceeding one million US dollars, mm. you must have a, a minimum percentage of Ugandans on those projects. So that's why companies must endeavor to have enough Ugandans on those projects. Okay. It's all in the coming from the regulations. Um, then also there's an issue, uh, also the same regulations talk about training, both technology and skills. So you're mandated to train the people you bring on to make sure that you pass on the skills. Mm. And when we talk abo uh, about training, uh, you know, they, they, it comes in different forms. We have had uh, trainings for heavy good drivers, uh, good, uh, heavy good vehicle tra uh, drivers, um, the trailers and, you know, and, 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 and other heavy good vehicles. Uh, that was done with partnership with G uh, uh, GIZ, together with the government. We have had, you know, 
uh, incubator programs uh, facilitated by Stanbic Bank to make sure that it prepare the Ugandans with enough skills, understand the project, what the projects are all about first and all, and then I also understand what, you know, how they need to prepare, what quality is being required, what health and safety requirements are being needed on these projects. Yeah. So we have had incubator projects. We have also had uh, um, welder uh, training uh, being s sponsored by both the companies and also by um, other players in the industry. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about the welders, we need uh, the, the bulk of the work at the start where the construction involves some welding, it has some scaffolding. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about crafts, so the majority of the workforce Mm -hmm. that will be needed during the construction phase. Uh, so the trainings have to be undertaken and like I said, there was some somewhere where the level of skill, you know, y you have the supervisory, you have the main one, you have the basic, the entry levels, it will depend. So th they will have to look to all the, all the market, uh, all the labor markets that are available to make sure that we have the skills that are necessary. But trainings have been undertaken, though they may not be enough more will continue during the implementation phases. Well, yeah. Mr. Nwagaba, thank you so much. Uh, right about now, we are going to take a short break. And remember, you can be part of the conversation. Just go to our social media platforms, that is Twitter and Facebook, and use the hashtag AllUganda. You can ask questions or make a comment. We shall be able to share that right here on NTV. Do not go away. and welcome back to our one-on-one -on -one dialogue about the opportunities of you Ugandans, the chances you have in the oil and gas sector. How can you take that opportunity by the horn and achieve greatness? And probably in studio, I want you to know that I have Mr. Richard Nwagaba, who is the regulations and drilling and completions manager, sorry about it, of Uganda National oil company to discuss this further you can be part of the conversation go to our twitter and facebook uh, platforms and use the hashtag oil uganda so mr nwagaba i'll come back to you before the break we were talking about the opportunities and how ugandan farms can be part of the process the construction process what is the contracting pro, uh, status but now and what are the requirements that the farms need to be considered Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I will start with uh, what is required. Yeah. Because we, we, before we broke off, we talked about what enables the enabling um, registration, legislation, or enabling um, you know, acts that are in place uh, to which um, you know, maximize participation of Ugandans on these projects. But now, going to what people need. Mm. Uh, we need first to talk about the fact that whatever is needed both in services and materials and uh, equipment is must be of high quality <laughs> and we talk about quality we talk about you know you must take care of, of safety in, on the operations and for the personnel uh, you must also ensure that the environment is um, you know, left as pristine, as as close as pristine as it was found before the operation started. Uh, so we talked about quality, health, safety, and environment uh, are key uh, on, on these projects. So to start with, for you to participate in the oil and gas sector in Uganda, mm -hmm. you must be a registered entity on the National Supplier Database. Uh, you can register as a company or as an individual the requirements are different for the different uh, segments. Um, for a company, you need a tax clearance from uh, URA. Yeah. Uh, you need an NSSF certificate uh, from the person who takes care of uh, the pension benefits for the employed people. Mm. And, uh, those are the major ones. You need to have a certificate of incorporation as well. Uh, so th those are the key component uh, requirements. You must have a bank account as well. So once you have those requirements, you go and register. The registration will be valid for the next three years. You have to renew after three years. 
Um, of course, you must show that you have the experience that is needed. Mm. Like I said, it's high capex. You know, you're investing so much. Uh, you don't want, you know, somebody who hasn't done a similar activity in the past to try it on this, uh, or, or on this high cost activity uh, that is very tight on schedule. That yeah. means you have delays and all that. So you must make sure you may have the right people on the project to make sure they deliver the project on time and on cost, or even under cost, that would be the preferred delivery mode. Mm. Uh, so talking of standards, we already talked about those ones. You must make sure that you know, you, you when you're demonstrating your past experience, you must sh show that you know you've delivered quality projects, <laughs> you know, in a safe manner, yeah, and without uh, compromising the environment and also the safety of your employees. Of course, we're talking about the resources, you know, uh, that is manpower, you have, have the right skill set, you must train your people. Uh, you must make sure that you have the right technology to execute the work that is extended to you. If you're a road contractor, you must have the right equipment. And also, you must have the money to execute the work program that is given to you. If you're given a work scope for four kilometers of a road and you have four months to complete that road, because that's how tight the deadlines are, you must have the right tools, the right people, and enough money to execute that work program in that given time frame. Um, so, in short, uh, that's what you need. Register on the National Supplier Database, mm. commonly called NSD, in short. Then have the right experience, have the right people, have the money to execute the work program, have the right people and the tools. And uh, the contracting status. So Which companies have been uh, So given? now, talking the contracting process and, um, you know, in connection to what we talked about before we broke off, um, we talked about unbundling. So for when you look at the Tlenga project and the, the Kingfisher project and the ECOP, I wanted to concentrate mainly on the Tlenga, the upstream components, mm. uh, which is the Tlenga and the Kingfisher projects. Uh, of course, uh, as I already described, we have um, this, uh, the, the well pads, the scope for Tilenga. We are talking about 31 well pads to be prepared. Some will be prepared f before first oil. We're talking about 2025 January. Yeah. That's the target. So we have a certain well pa uh, set of well pads that have been completed mm. so that we can, and drilling happens before first oil. Some can come in later. So we have 31 well pads. That scope is contracted uh, to um, uh, one contractor north of the Nile and another one south of the Nile. So the well pads north of the Nile, we have motor engine, the same contractor that is, uh, has the scope for uh, the CPF, the earthworks. So the earthworks, the CPF is uh, a four kilometer by four kilometer on average, roughly, mm. a piece of, of, of land. So the CPF area is where we are going to have the central processing facility. We have other facilities I on the central processing uh, area, what we call the industrial area for Tilenga, the four square meter uh, uh, you know, acreage. Mm -hmm. So we have construction camps, we have a drilling support base, a construction support base in there. Uh, we have a gate, we have a fence, we have a trench around it. So all that scope is being done by different uh, co contractors. contractors. Yes, but and the preference is local contractors. Of course, later on we also have uh, what we call an operation, uh, what we call an operation camp, mm. where now after we've drilled the wells, we have set up the facilities, we have done the interconnection networks. Uh, the infield the pipelines we have done there's a feeder pipeline that connects to from the CPF both Tilenga and Kingfisher going north of uh, I mean to the Kabare where we have the pump station number one mm. we have 100 kilometers also being constructed um, that's another s another scope on its own but that one for the Tilenga that one will be done by the same contractor doing the eco pipeline yeah. the eco is the East African crude pipeline for the Kingfisher, it's another contractor. Well, what, so that's what we call um, uh, EPC4 for Kingfisher. That is the 45. So for Kingfisher, it is shorter, 45 kilometers. Coming the same point, we combine the production, goes to uh, the ECOP. 
then to Tanga, where it is exported. Um, breaking it further, so now the package is under Tilenga project. We have the neighboring infrastructure as one package. Yeah. We have the main facilities, that is at this, what we call at the central processing facilities. That is another scope. That one was contracted to McDermott. It's a, um, a JV between McDermott and Sinopec. Uh, uh, Sinopec is a Chinese f uh, farm. Uh, they are specialized in that, in that work, it's a specialized work scope. Yeah. Um, but of course, they, s you know, y they, they give some of the scope to the local companies. If this, uh, the construction scope is again given to the local companies. Now, if you're uh, talking of uh, the subcontracting, say, on the P uh, EPSSCC, that is the main contract for the facilities. Mm. For, uh, if I'm going to give you examples of the subcontracting that is being undertaken, we have uh, a JV doing the construction camp. Yeah, it's, it's a JV between uh, Kamado, uh, I think Kamado and another Ugandan farm. Mm. So that that scope for the construction camp has already been subcontracted. We have other uh, you know, subcontracts in there, you know, the catering services, because we have that camp, the construction camp alone is 4,000 personnel at peak. Yeah. They need to eat. They need to eat, you, yeah. know, you know, you need to do laundry for them. You need to have, have other facilities, recreation facilities, yeah. where somebody goes to the field for four weeks, you know, four weeks on, four weeks off. You must make sure they have enough comfort for other hospitality. Uh, for hospitality. Mm. Uh, so we, we have those who say, you know, accom accommodation, you know, uh, and other catering and services uh, involved in there. Then we also have the other package, the main package, so three packages, enable infrastructure, the main facilities are the central processing plant, then drilling and wells, you know, drilling of the wells, you know, doing the completion of the wells, installation of the wellhead gear and the interconnection lines. Mm. That's another scope that is also subcontracted to another service provider. Um, uh, then um, for the Kingfisher, so now if, if we look at the enabling infrastructure, we have different packages. Uh, and we, we can classify them as uh, CFT1, uh, which is the industrial area preparation, mm -hmm. which I said were, uh, go, go went to Motor Engine Uganda. That one is already awarded. We have access roads which are being done by power engineering. We've heard of power, power has been in construction here in Uganda for many years. Yeah. Now we have um, some road networks, A1, and two, uh, three road networks, uh, and another road north of the Nile uh, being done by power engineering. Then site preparation being done by motor engineer. Um, the main facilities, that's, uh, we said the JV, McDermott, Sinopec doing that work scope. For drilling, it had 10 packages, drilling and wells. So you drill the wells, complete them. We had uh, the drill, the, the rigs themselves, mm. but that scope could not be done uh, here. So we had to, that had been contracted out. But of course, still, and when you talk about con contracts, these are what we call tier one contracts. We'll have tier two and tier three. Mm. Now, to uh, make it put in plain terms, we are saying total all the operator, total energies, contract, say, McDermott. That's what we call a tier one contractor. Mm. Now, the tier one contractor subcontracts, that's a tier two. The tier two also subcontracts some scope. Tier three, mm -hmm. uh, tier three we might look for manpower services for my uh, recruitment farm in, Uga in, in Kampala here. Yeah. So. You know, it's uh, you know a multiplier effect. Uh, whoever gets a small a, a contract, say for catering, needs food, uh, you know, it, it needs all other services. Now has got the farmers to also subcontract. Somebody's going to provide the food. Now the food goes. The fo a person who has a contract to to provide food so to feed four thousand plus people or five thousand. You know, you can't do it alone. You must also look for other subcontractors to provide you vegetables, meat, and mm -hmm. all that. So you see that we have, you know, lower, 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 higher, higher, and tier, higher tiers coming up in this contracting process, basically. And those are all, are all those opportunities that are available to a local Ugandan. So that's why I encourage people to 
you know, form, you know, when you, you know, have bigger groups, you're stronger, you have a better negotiation and negotiating power. Mm. Then you learn these deals, then you can, you know, afford to have a centralized collection point where you can make sure that your quality is improved to an acceptable level. Whereas if you go as an individual, you won't get any mm. of these facilities. So forming partnerships on the farmer's group level, you know, even on the supplier's level, is very key to make sure to maximize this opportunity. Now, for the drilling and wells, uh, we have 10 packages. I'm not going to read them one by one, but the supply of the you know, equipment, installation, yeah. and thereafter, you know, hooking up, commissioning, and all that. But even those 10 packages you're talking about, so we've talked about, there's some level of subcontracting. All of them, before they are awarded, they have come with their national content plans. Because as we evaluate these contracts, and I think that's one thing I had, had uh, omitted on uh, the enabling, you know, features in place. Mm. The requirements. The requirements. Uh, no, no, that is on what enables the Ugandan to participate. Mm. So when, on the evaluation, even if a company, when, because you first look at the technical scope and say this person or this company can, you know, deliver scope A, B, C, and D mm. to our requirements, so the scope of requirements that have been described. But then now, once you take off the technical course, then now you go to the second level. And now you're looking at, the, you know, the commercials. So who has the lowest and has the best technical? Now, when, when you come to the commercials, you have a pass mark. Of has, whoever has passed the technicals moves to the next stage, which is the commercial stage. Mm. Now, if there's a variation in the commercial cost that has been proposed of less than five and below, then you go ahead and pick, you can pick somebody who has a higher commercial offer but has a better local content provision in its contracting strategy. So that also enables the local players to take part in, in these contracts. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the local player is being, you know, trying to, to be pulled to a level of where that, that we maximize uh, local participation. Now, talking of Kingfisher, Kingfisher, we have four main packages. Uh, we have PC1, we already uh, explained, uh, talked about it. It mainly concentrates on the civils, uh, civil works on the well pads, and that scope went to Excel. Excel is also a, a local construction company, a Ugandan company. Then we have um, oil field infrastructure. That's also a main uh, comp uh, comp uh, component of the project. Then we also have um, infrastructure. We're talking about the roads, the, the road network uh, within the, um, the field. We also have an airfield in, um, in Kingfisher that is uh, going to support you know, movement of personnel mainly. Yeah during the construction phase, uh, then uh, decommissioned, and we have uh, a helipad there after for the supporting, because the, the, the numbers after the construction period of three and a half years, talking about 42 months, the numbers really drop from the 6,000, you're talking about 4,000 mm. ETC to minimal numbers. So now here, I hope that can support uh, the, uh, the, uh, the operations of, of Kingfisher. So we'll have um, a helipad um, incorporated in that. Mm. Then, um, we also, also have a um, uh, supply of, because we, we said for gas, it's w part will be used to generate power to support the facilities, yeah. the f operations in the field. The rest will be converted into LPG and sold both on the local market and regionally. That saves the environment yeah. at the end of the day. Um, of course, those three construction projects have supervision contracts, and some for the civils have gone to local companies as well. Uh, we have Kaga and partners um, doing the supervision uh, on, the, on, the, on, on, on PC1. Yeah. They're already on site, mobilized. Of course, we also have the drilling and completions package, just like for Tilenga, we also have a drilling com and completions package. Yeah. Mm, uh, the supply of materials, what we call OCTG, that is the pipeline, the pipes that are going to be used. Yeah. That one is um, another company, but all those companies, like I've said, have an obligation to make sure they optimize or maximize local participation. Well, Mr. Nwaga, mm -hmm. as we conclude this conversation, because we have run out of time, we have about two minutes. Yeah. Uh, we've, talk about, we've talked about the opportunities that are available for Ugandan farms, Ugandan companies, the 
opportunities plus also ways in how the country as a whole can actually gain from the gas and oil sector. What conclusive remarks do you have for Ugandans towards the future of oil and gas in the country? Uh, what I can say to Ugandans is um, that uh, the regulators, uh, first and foremost, I need to clear the air that <laughs> Enoch is not a regulator. Enoch is the business arm of the government. Yes. We go into these investments as in partners mm -hmm. on the investment side. Uh, so the, the government has put up frameworks, enabling frameworks to make sure that they maximize the participation of Ugandans on these projects. Because that's yeah. how we can retain value in country. If we don't maximize participation of Ugandan and Ugandan farms, then you have repatriation of you know, proceeds and all that going outside. So government has put up an enabling you know, framework, an enabling environment mm -hmm. for Ugandans to participate through the Regulations Acts and, 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 and name it. And has gone ahead to provide you know, training facilities. We have supplier workshops happening every quarter. We mm. have industry enhancement centers in the field to make sure that people can have a go-to center for information. You know, we, we have partnerships with uh, banks to make sure they can provide financing for the local farms. Uh, so now, what I want to encourage Ugandans or Ugandan farms is that they should try their level-based and form partnerships mm. because the amounts being required <coughs> on these projects are, are, are huge. They are huge. So as a single individual company or entity, you may not be able to fully you know, optimize or take on these opportunities. Mm. So you need to form JVs with people so that you come strong and take on these uh, facilities have enough skills, prepare yourself yeah. on the uh, QHSE uh, and the quality and all that. So prepare yourself on the human resource, on the technology, on the capital and the people. Basically. Thank you so much, Mr. Yeah. Nuagaba Richard, for this interesting and insightful mm -hmm. dialogue. And if you at home, if you want to catch up with the conversation that we've been having, you can go straight to our YouTube channel, look out for NTV Uganda, and you'll be able to go through the information that we have gotten from Mr. Nwagawa right here. And be part of the conversation. Go to our social media platforms. That is Twitter and Facebook. Use the hashtag AllUganda. Well, catch you next time. Up next is the news. NTV at 1.